In the previous lectures, we've talked about transactions. We have seen that transactions consist of inputs and outputs, and we have seen how they are created and how they can be used. But one thing we have not talked about so far is the spending conditions or the unlocking scripts and how they can be assembled. So for example, on the what conditions exactly you can spend these UTXOs. And it turns out that there is quite some flexibility when you're constructing these unlocking conditions. It's not just plain signatures, it's actually much more powerful than that. And that is exactly what we will look at in this lecture. All right, so let's get started with the various transaction types and the unlocking conditions that uh, can be used in the context of Bitcoin transactions. So what you already know to some extent uh, is that these unlocking conditions that they are written in something called script, which is a scripting language, obviously. And you have some predetermined commands in there, which are referred to as OP codes. So you can um, quite flexibly design what exactly the unlocking conditions are using these OP codes. And the most straightforward ones, as you will see, and as you have already seen in previous examples, are simple signatures. So basically where you're saying, okay, um, this output, this unspent transaction output can be spent by someone who is able to provide a signature that can be verified with a specific public key, as an example. That's actually the first one we will see. Um, the entire conditions, so the validation of these conditions is based on a stacking principle, so essentially with a uh, last in, first out. So you put everything on top of it, all the conditions, also the verification um, and the solution script. Uh, and uh, you can think of it basically as a, as a deck of cards. So you put everything on top of it and then you're taking it up and you're using one by one, taking these cards, following the instructions. And at the, at the end of the uh, transaction, at the end of this instruction set, when everything went through smoothly, when you have a, a one at the end, so for true, uh, then you know that the conditions are fulfilled. Uh, this sounds very abstract now, but just think of this deck of cards, of this deck of cards, and you will see the examples with the various conditions uh, throughout this slide deck. As I said, um, the output can only be successfully referenced, so uh, we only assume that somebody is able to actually spend it uh, when the entire stack, when all of these instructions can go through, when solutions for all of them can be provided, and when it ex executes successfully uh, with a one at the end. Um, what's really important is that this instruction set, this Bitcoin script lang uh, scripting language, does not contain any loops, doesn't contain uh, any sophisticated um, operators that allow, allow you to move around, go back, for example, uh, for one simple reason. Uh, imagine when you have a, a loop in the scripting language. Uh, then it can be shown quite easily that when you have loops in the scripting, lang scripting language in the instruction set, that it could bring the uh, unlocking condition in a state where you are in an infinite verification loop. And when you allow for that, when you allow for infinite verification loops, it would be quite easy uh, to slow down the entire network, to bring the verification nodes in states where they're just infinitely verifying. And that would be really bad. That would not be a good idea. And that is the reason why there is this standardized instruction set, this relatively limited instruction set that is still, as you will see, uh, really powerful and can be used for a lot of different approaches for a lot of different unlocking conditions. And today is actually the first step in the direction of economic scripting. Uh, this will be a topic later on in this class where we show what you can do with all of these unlocking conditions in terms of payment channels, let's say, in terms of conditional payments. And today that's just the basics for that. All right, so uh, recall last time we talked about these transactions. We said transactions of inputs, outputs, um, and we also talked about the unlocking conditions and the solution script. And essentially what you have here is this is the first transaction. This is the second transaction. Uh, this right here, here we go, is the input of the first transaction. It creates a new output. So a, a, at some point an unspent transaction output with a script pop key. And script pop key in this case is just a, a strange, strange word for the uh, unlocking condition. So basically the condition that must be fulfilled for someone else to be able to spend it. And then you have here the second transaction with the input. And obviously when you're using this output from the previous transaction as an input in the new one, then you have to provide the solution. And that's exactly the script six. So script six essentially just stands for the solution. 
And when you are able to represent this solution in your transaction, then you're able to reference this previously unspent transaction output and you can create a new unspent transaction output with your conditions. So of course, then again, you have a, a new script pop key in your output right here. Uh, and this time you define, you choose what exactly the uh, condition, the unlocking condition is. Uh, so you can put that into your transaction. So let's go with the first one. The first one is called uh, pay to public key and it is not used anymore. It has been used in the beginning of Bitcoin. It's the most straightforward uh, forward, uh, unlocking condition, but these days it's not used anymore. Uh, as you will see, there is a slightly more complicated one, uh, pay to address that is uh, used much more often than pay to, pay to public key. The idea behind pay to public key is that you have the uh, script pop key so that is the unlocking condition from the previous transaction that says there is a specific pub public key, okay? So this stands for, this is basically a placeholder variable for a specific public key. And then you have the operator OP check sig. So that's the OP code right here. And yeah, I mean, it's not that complicated. What could OP check sig possibly do? I mean, obviously it's gonna check the signature. That's what it stands for. And what you have to provide is a solution in the script sig. That's just a signature again, that right here, this sig is just a placeholder uh, for a specific signature. So pay the public key links the output directly to the public key, as you would uh, assume by the by the name. Um, the solution, the script SIG, only includes the corresponding signature, so a specific one, the SIG right here. And uh, the public key is, is uh, added as part of the unlocking condition. Okay, it's part of the unlocking condition. It's hard coded in there. Uh, so it is uh, part of this script pop key. And what happens right here is first, uh, you're putting the script SIG right here on the stack. And this really is this stack of cards I've been talking about previously. So you have that on the stack. And then after that, you put the pop key on there. This is from the script pop key. So from the unlocking condition. And then you have the operator OP check sick and OP check sick just takes two elements and compares whether this signature is valid given a specific private key. And if this happens, if this is okay, then we know, okay, uh, we have a one, it's a true outcome. Uh, that's all that's left. So the entire script went through with an outcome of one. So it's valid. And that's really easy. That's just when you when you're basically when you're paying Bitcoin directly to a, to a public key. In this case, the public key would really be the pseudonym of this person. Uh, and as I said, that's uh, hardly it's, it's not really used anymore. Uh, what is used instead is um, pay to address. And recall, I've mentioned that uh, previously that um, when we're talking about public keys as pseudonyms these days, that's a severe simplification. Uh, what people actually use in many cases, uh, there are other options as you will see in the SegWit chapter, but for now, uh, what you have to be aware of are Bitcoin addresses. And the Bitcoin address essentially is just uh, an additional move. So you start with the public key and then you hash it with SHA-256, you hash it with this RIPMD-160, you have a public key hash, then you have a certain encoding, base 58 check encoding with a one prefix and that will be your Bitcoin address. And that's basically what you're using. Now note, um, encoding, of course, that's a two-way function. So you can go back from the Bitcoin address to this public key hash. But hashes, uh, as you have seen in the previous videos, hashes are one-way functions, okay? Uh, so you cannot, uh, you cannot go back once you, once you see the public key hash, uh, there is no way back to the public key. And that will be really important when you're looking at the unlocking condition later on at the solution script. Now, what does it add? Uh, it adds some flexibility because now you have an address. Um, also, as you will see later on, there are some other Bitcoin addresses that allow you to uh, add entire scripts, so specific instructions, more flexible instructions. Uh, it's much more comfortable, again, because you have this address with public keys, it's quite cumbersome. Uh, it's actually more expensive because you have to store a lot more early on. Uh, it's also a higher burden on the mempool, which is usually stored in the in the RAM of the computers. Um, that's not the case right here because you don't have to store the entire public key in there. And most importantly, it's an additional security element. This might be counterintuitive at first because of course it's a, it's a shorter bit length with this just 160. Um, but when you think about it, it's not only secured by ECDSA, it's not only secured by the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm um, that is actually somewhat um, vulnerable to quantum computers, but in this case it's also secured by hash functions. 
So you have this hash, and since you cannot uh, just go back to the public key from the, from the uh, hash value from the Bitcoin address, it's actually much harder to attack a Bitcoin address uh, if we assume uh, that quantum computers reach a certain state. And this will buy you some time. Um, and makes actually these these Bitcoin addresses these. Uh, transaction type that is based on Bitcoin address is much more robust. But how does it work? Uh, when you have a, a script pop key, so this is the condition with uh, op dop, that's just a duplication, uh, op hash 160, that's just a hashing to the Bitcoin address from a, from a public key. And then you have a pop key hash, a specific one. Again, this is the placeholder, this is your variable. So you have a pop key hash in there, a specific one, basically a Bitcoin address. Uh, you have an op equal verify you will see why that is in there this just verifies that two elements the two topmost elements on top of the stack are actually the same and then again you have the op check sig and you already know that from the previous payment condition uh, where you're just verifying the signatures for the solution you need to provide two things number one again the signature and number two you also have to provide the public key because it's not in here and again as i mentioned earlier when i've shown you the derivation when somebody just has the public key hash there is no way back so the person who is providing the solution also has to provide the public key with it okay and the way uh it works i think that's just your notes right here yes i think i said everything uh the way it works is again you first put the script sick on the stack so the the signature and the public key uh, and then you have this op dub this duplication and this just duplicates the topmost element in this case uh the public key so you have two copies of this public key of the exact same the next op code is the op hash 160 so what it does is it takes this element of the public key and applies the uh, two uh, hash functions and the encoding to it and then you have this public key hash right here okay and then you take the public key hash that has been provided uh, as part of the unlocking script so this is part of the unlocking condition the red one whereas the green one is the one that has been derived from the public key that has been provided with the solution okay so this one again this one is part of the unlocking condition of the utxo and this one the green one right here has been derived from the public key that has been presented as part of the solution as part of the script sick uh, so when somebody cheats, when somebody puts in a, a, uh, the wrong public key, let's say, uh, then these two elements will not be the same. Uh, you, this ensures that somebody has to provide uh, a public key that uh, corresponds to the Bitcoin address that is part of the unlocking condition. And the way we check that is with this OP equal verify. So we, we check if these uh, two pop key hashes right here, if these two topmost elements are in fact the same. Okay. If that's okay, then uh, we proceed in our execution, and now it's very straightforward. Now you're basically left with what we had earlier. Now it's just this <laughs> pay to public key again. Uh, you have a pop key on there, you have the signature on there, and you have this OP check sig verifier uh, operator. So you can verify if the signature corresponds uh, to the public key. And if this executes successfully, you have this one left, and you have the pay to public key hash payment condition. Um, yeah, so it's 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 just as you can see, it's it's an addition. It's it's basically an extension of the pay to public key payment condition, uh, where instead of paying to the public key directly, you're using this public key hash or Bitcoin address, uh, and then of course you have to add some additional verification steps in the script. So what else is there? There is a, a, a native multisig. Uh, multisig means you have payments. Um, where that can only be spent when you have m of n signatures so you can you can define a, in the unlocking uh, condition you can define a set of, of uh, um, n public keys essentially uh, and say at least m of them uh, um, or m of the corresponding private key holders must sign uh, for this transaction to be valid for this output to be able to be spent okay so unlocking condition script pop key includes n public keys and as i said it says that at least m of the corresponding private keys must provide a valid signature in the script sick 
and uh, I mean the applications it's it's quite it's quite straightforward of course you can think of joint accounts you can think of corporate accounts it's for security measures for example uh, you could you could set up a, a, a two uh, of three so uh, m equals two n equals three uh, multi-sig condition where you're saying mm, okay uh, i'm storing one of the private keys at home let's say i'm storing one in a i don't know with, with, with a friend uh, uh, I, I trust with a family member and the last one i store uh, in my in my uh, uh, bank safe deposit box as an example and none of these single sources can on their own uh, actually sign the transaction spend is on spend transaction output uh, you need at least two of them uh, yet when for example your your house burns down or when there is a flood or some other reason why you might lose one of these private keys you could still uh, actually um, you're still in the possession of two of them you can you have access to two of them and you can still uh, issue the transaction now there are easier ways to do that you don't necessarily have to do that on chain there is for example uh, an algorithm called shamir secret sharing uh, where you can split one individual private key um, has essentially the same effect except that you do that off chain um, and you then it's much uh, it's much less expensive of course because you don't have to push all of these signatures on chain uh, then what you're doing is you have one private key uh, you split it up this single private key with Shamir um, the, essentially you're saying uh, you, you're, you're constructing it in a way uh, that again to reconstruct this single private key you need at least m of n parts shards uh, the oven that has been split um, uh, before okay so it's it's two different approaches here with multi-sig you're doing that on chain the signatures get verified on chain and chain the alternative would be shamir with shamir you're splitting one individual private key into parts and again you need uh, m of n parts uh, to be able to reconstruct this private key now the way it works is you have uh, the op0 element right here uh, that's essentially just because uh, the way it's constructed the entire script removes one element too much uh, so you have this op0 on here that's for for technical reasons you can completely forget about that and then you have the first signature and the second signature so that's the the uh, script sick that's the solution that's been provided and then you're adding the unlocking condition on top of that as always and in the unlocking condition you have the m which in this case is two you have the three potential public keys um, so one two and three and you have n in there um, that's the maximum number so that you know that the, the script knows how, how many elements will actually be public keys and then you have the uh, op check multisig that's the operator native one to check this multisig condition and when this when this uh, gets executed then it looks at the topmost element right here three then it takes these three public keys right here then it looks at the next element which is m it knows it has to take these uh, two elements right here the two signatures and then it performs this op check multisig for all of them um, what you can see is and this is really important that the order actually plays a role so you have to make sure that um, that the the order is, is the same so it wouldn't it wouldn't work if you for example have public key one uh, on top of public key two so if this would be public key one right here this public key two uh, then you also had to switch the the all the of the signatures in your solution script and the reason why this is is because you always start with the topmost um, public key element right here you look at the topmost signature right here in this case that's not a match when it's not a match uh, then what happens is you move down with the public keys right here public key two compared to signature two that's actually a match so you have one of two um, that all have been uh, have been able to successfully verify and when you're successful with the verification then both of these pointers here move down one so you're moving down the public key pointer but you're also moving down the signature pointer and you have public key one that gets compared to signature one and again that's of course successful so you have two out of two uh, signatures that have been valid and uh, then this, this element also gets removed you end up with this one on the stack and you know uh, it's valid now this hardly gets used anymore it's it's <laughs> there is a native multisig option in bitcoin but uh, most multisig implementations uh, pretty much all multisig implementations are based on this pay to script hash and pay to script hash really is just a flexible script 
um, where you can um, use any of these codes, any of these uh, OP codes, any conditions you can think of and add it into the script. And you can do, uh, we don't go into too much detail here. Again, we have a dedicated lecture just for that when we talk about economic scripting. But the idea is that you can come up with creative unlocking conditions, also optional ones where, for example, you could say, okay, uh, this output could be spent by, by um, these two person in combination. So if we have signatures by um, that can be associated with these two public keys, let's say, that is fine. Or alternatively, when a certain time has passed, so we have a time lock in there, uh, then uh, a third person could spend it individually. And you can combine many of these different scripts, many of these different OP codes, many of these different conditions in a, in a very flexible script, and that is essentially pay to script hash. Now, with pay to script hash, the script SIG is really any valid script. And the script pop key, so the unlocking condition, is the op hash 160 uh, of this script. Um, um, so you, you prefer, uh, excuse me, you have the op code uh, hash 160 in there, and you have the you have the actual hash in there of the script, uh, and then you have the op equal verify. And of course, as you will see later on, when somebody presents the script as a solution, then it gets hashed. And then it gets again compared if it is the same one, and then it gets executed if it is in fact the same one. So you, this way you make sure that with the unlocking condition and the embedded hash of the script, you make sure that um, somebody has to provide exactly this one script so that the script cannot be changed. And uh, with the script that is presented, you also ensure that it must be executed in exactly that way. Okay. Um, to reference the transaction output, the person must provide the script SIG, as I've seen, as I've said, uh, who, who, whose hash value corresponds to the hash value set in the script pop key. That's exactly what I've just said. Uh, so again, you essentially, when you're when you're providing the solution, um, then you're providing the, the the script, the entire script, and then it gets compared to the hash that has been in the unlocking condition. And that's the other part I've also mentioned. If this succeeds, uh, the complete script of the script six is run in a second step. Um, so first you compare if it's actually the same script and uh, in a second step, then it actually gets run. Okay. Um, so you could implement, as I've said, a simple multisig with, with this. It's actually quite straightforward. And that's um, how multisig usually is implemented these days. Uh, native multisig doesn't exist anymore. Um, and it's not used anymore. So the way you do that is you have these two signatures on the stack. So uh, SIG Y and SIG X, uh, you have the entire script on there. Um, you actually put that on there with OP hash 160. Um, the OP, the uh, script gets hashed. So you have the script hash right here. And then you take the script hash from the unlocking condition. So again, this script, script hash right here is from the script SIG as all the uh, two signatures. Um, and this one is from the from the script pop key. So from the unlocking condition, you have the OP equal um, from the unlocking condition. These two get compared. And if they're compared, then you know, okay, that's fine. Excuse me, you know, that's fine. You have this one right here. And what happens then is that you can run the actual script and the actual script, this would be the multi-sig script right here in this pay to script hash. Uh, and then you can compare, you can check these two signatures. And there are some advantages. Uh, number one is that um, when you add this condition, so when you add an UTXO of this unlocking condition, uh, then you don't have to provide the public key at this point in time. Uh, which adds some, which has some security benefits. Also has the benefit that it is much cheaper to do so at this point in time. That the public keys don't have to be stored in the RAM, so in, uh, they are not part of the mempool. They are only provided uh, once someone um, spends it. So as part of the script SIG. And number two, you have an actual Bitcoin address because that's a really cool thing with pay to script hash. With pay to script hash. You essentially end up with a Bitcoin address that starts with a three, and that's also a big benefit just in terms of handling. It's it's not that cumbersome anymore. In terms of characteristics, we can say that by using this cryptographically secure hash value, it can be ensured that the unlocking condition can only be solved using the previously specified script. That's what I've mentioned earlier. So you 
And you cannot just use any script, obviously. You can only use the one that has been specified earlier. And number two, you have a high degree of flexibility, as I've said. Um, there is this really powerful scripting language and uh, you can pretty much employ anything that's in there and uh, use this in very creative ways. And uh, scripts can only uh, scripts only need to be submitted at the time of the transaction. This really goes back to what I've mentioned with the public key. So it's much less expensive um, since, for example, with multisig, you don't have to provide the public key when you're creating the UTXO. You only have to provide it uh, when you're spending it. And that's that's really powerful because it puts a much lower burden on, on the uh, validating nodes, on the full nodes that actually keep that or have to keep that in their mempool, so in their RAM otherwise. And as I mentioned, once again, I've been running ahead, apologies for that. Um, it can be represented by a Bitcoin address, so you have this prefix. Uh, you have this prefix of free in this case, so whenever you see a Bitcoin address that starts with a free, uh, this indicates that you have some form of a pay to script hash. In many cases, it will be a simple multi-sig address. Possible problems. With um, pay to script hash, um, you could potentially run into an issue that you're creating an address based on an invalid script. <laughs> that would be really bad. So uh, you could you could just um, create an address um, based on a, a script that uh, cannot be solved, where no solution exists, and you wouldn't necessarily realize that. Um, and number two is when you're losing the script, then you're basically losing the recipe on how to spend it. Recall that you have to present this script when you're trying to spend it as part of the script sick. And uh, when you're losing it, of course, then you cannot present it. And both of these issues, both these problems would result in the loss of the Bitcoin units. Uh, then you couldn't, you couldn't spend the Bitcoin units that are part of this unspent transaction output anymore. The last thing um, is a null data transaction type or OP return. Uh, that's actually quite straightforward. Null data unlocking conditions aren't really transactions in a financial sense. Um, they are used to add arbitrary data. So to store arbitrary data of up to uh, 40 bytes or 320, 320 bits on the blockchain. Okay, so basically you can write something on there. Uh, it's stored on there and po possible application as you will also see later on are for example, proof of existence um, where you um, hash something, a certain file, and then you're writing the hash value of that file onto the blockchain uh, to prove that this exact file, this exact document has existed at a certain point in time, uh, specifically when this block has been mined, so when this, when this transaction has been confirmed. And also many of the color coin implementations, color coins these days are uh, obsolete, and nobody uses them anymore, at least not to a large extent. Uh, everything um, in terms of tokens is pretty much based on, on Ethereum, on the ERC-20 token standard. But in the early days, uh, people used OP return um, data um, to add some metadata to, to uh, certain uh, outputs. Um, and this, uh, the idea was that you could add additional meaning to outputs, for example, say, okay, whoever is able to, whoever, whoever presents this specific output to me, um, for example, gets an ounce of gold. So a promise for delivery that is based on Bitcoin, and uh, you could have added additional metadata that is used for these systems via this OP return. Okay, but what it does is essentially it says, hey, I am not a financial transaction, don't worry about me, don't store me in the mempool, don't store me in this transaction queue, uh, I'm just some, some data on the blockchain, uh, but you can forget about me in, in terms of uh, being being spendable, okay? That's that's the entire idea, and uh, there are many interesting applications with that. But of course, uh, not for our financial transactions, uh, not for the economic scripting that we will look later on, uh, where we talk about specific conditions under which these transactions or these UTXO can be spent. All right, uh, so that's it for today. These are various transaction types. There will be some more when we talk about SegWit, but these are really the basic ones. Uh, and again, then when we talk about the economic scripting, uh, you will get some more insights into how powerful and flexible this approach actually is. Stay curious, see you soon.